Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Dangerous entanglements and contradictory alliances. Is the U.S. hazardously hostage to its many client states? How well do these client states and alliances serve America's national and geopolitical interests? And is Washington helplessly overstretched in its foreign policy commitments? To Crosstalk America's Foreign Entanglements, I'm joined by my guest, John Glazer in Washington. He is a contributing editor at Antiwar.com and a columnist for the Washington Times Community Section. In New York, we have Dav Waxman. He is an associate professor at the City University of New York and the co-director of the Middle East Center at Northeastern University. And in Los Angeles, we have Nick Hankoff. He is on the national outreach team for the Tenth Amendment Center. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules. In effect, that means you can jump in anytime you want, and I very much encourage it. Uh, John, if I can go to you first, you recently published an article, uh, The Danger of Entangling Alliances, and you ended by saying the fiction that every corner of the earth is a vital U.S. interest and the consequent state of perennial fear together make unnecessary conflict more likely, and that is the great danger of entangling alliances. Why did you write that? What does it mean, and why now? Well, I wrote that with uh, the fact in mind that we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of the First World War. And as any first-year college student can tell you, um, what really caused that global conflagration was a small scuffle um, in, in the Balkans. Uh, and it, it, what would have been a relatively small issue in terms of uh, global conflict uh, turned into a, a world war, primarily because of a system of alliances which uh, made greater powers beholden to the interests of smaller powers. And that's a great sort of illustration of a lot of what U.S. foreign policy is today. We have alliances all over the world because of a grand strategy that has been implemented, especially since World War II, that seeks to dominate the world. And so all of our interests, according to people in Washington, rest in every nook and cranny of the globe. And uh, we end up paying uh, the governments of, of smaller nations and arming them and making sure that they uh, are allied with us. But it ends up entangling us in conflicts that are none of our business. Okay, Dave in New York, would you agree with that or disagree? Entangling alliances, just too many, and it puts U.S. Um, interests uh, all over the world at risk. Well, I think certainly there is a danger of, of being overcommitted to allies, but I think at the moment, actually, far from um, like precipitating conflict, the, the opposite danger um, is that many of the U.S.'s longtime allies are now questioning uh, the, the degree to which they can rely on the United States, and that might actually encourage them themselves to take more assertive, perhaps risky action than they would do if they could rely upon the United States. So I think while, um, you know, John is certainly right to point to the example of the first World War to remind us of the danger uh, that alliances can pose and that they can drag countries uh, such as the United States into conflict. I think alliances can also be a source of restraint, um, such that uh, countries, be they uh, Japan, for instance, or Saudi Arabia or Israel, the more that they can rely on the United States, the more that they can trust their alliance with the United States, perhaps the less likely they are to find themselves in conflict. So I think alliances can also be a source can I just quickly um, respond happy, to that? I uh, think for it's... the United States, a source of uh, stability. Okay, John, I'll go, I'll go to you first, then I'll go to Nick. You want to rebut that? Go ahead, John. So, you know, this issue of uh, alliances causing countries to have more restraint is belied uh, by history. What's going on right now, for example, in the Asia-Pacific is that the United States is uh, boosting military and economic support for, its, uh, for all of China's neighboring rivals. So if you think about, for example, the maritime and territorial disputes that the Philippines has with China. The Philippines has been, you know, pushing out its navy and provoking uh, Chinese naval ships, and China's been doing its own uh, kind of uh, aggressive actions as well. But in a normal situation, the Philippines, which is a tiny, tiny nation, would never be so bold as to challenge uh, a, a rising regional great power like China. The only reason they're doing so is because we have a security agreement with them, which says that we'll come to their defense if they ever get in a conflict with China. 
Uh, and, you know, this is beneficial to us because we want military bases in their lands and we want to actually project power to check China. So, look, this is, a, this is a clear example of where an alliance can actually make the smaller power far more reckless in its actions and lead to, lead to actions that could actually create a war that nobody wants. Okay, Nick, if I can go to you in Los Angeles, do American allies, the smaller... Oh, I'm so, let me get to Nick this first time, okay? Nick, how, how would you weigh in from what we've heard here? Because we, we've heard from John that a client states can be a, a, a very much a, a downside for a country like the United States, and some of those countries have already been mentioned. We can think of Israel, Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, that, that's a very interesting mix when, it, when you look at it from Washington. Go ahead, Nick in Los Angeles. Interesting to say the least. And I read John's piece, The Danger of Entanglements. He uh, uses a, a quote from George Washington's farewell address that uh, struck me, and that was that uh, when, when a nation is, uh, when a nation has an alliance, whether uh, it's one dependent on its uh, affection towards another nation or mm. a constant warring relationship that, uh, that is uh, relying on its animosity, either the affection or the animosity ends up making that nation a, a slave. And that, uh, that is an idea that we have to revisit, that uh, even if there are so-called positive benefits of alliances, ultimately these, uh, these alliances enslave the, the country beyond any, any uh, requiem of, of constitutional resolve of how the country carries out its foreign policy. So on, uh, on that. We, we have to look at fundamentals, and fundamentally, the United States has gone far away. It's a, it's a bizarre world uh, turned upside down in our, our foreign affairs that we don't follow the Constitution, we don't follow the advice of the founders, and that's why I'm on John's side as, uh, okay. as far as alliances being dangerous or not. They're inherently dangerous. Okay, I don't want this to be two against one. So, Dov, you, you, uh, yeah, you want to rebut what uh, John had to say and that, probably what Nick had to say. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to just... Right, yeah, just to, to, just to go back to the point that John was making. Um, while it may be uh, true in the case of, of a country, a small state like the Philippines, it, it may, I think he has a point that it may well embolden them. Let's, let's take two real potential flashpoints, two, two areas where the, we can really imagine a conflict. One, um, Japan and, and China, uh, and the other, Israel and Iran. And let's ask ourselves, imagine a situation where uh, the United States wasn't involved, the United States hadn't made uh, alliance commitments to either of those two countries. Would the risk of conflict be greater or lesser in, in those situations? And I would argue that, in, in, in certainly in, in the case of uh, the, the you know, tensions between Japan and China, which we're, we've seen lately over the East China Sea, that it's precisely because of America's commitment to Japan that the Japanese um, have, have been restrained. And in fact, I, I would argue that Japan's uh, post-war uh, pacifism um, has been as a result, of course, of its ability to rely upon the United States for its security. And the United States is a moderating influence in the in that relationship between uh, China and Japan. And similarly, if we turn to uh, the, the tension, uh, long-standing tension, but particularly over uh, Iran's nuclear program between Israel and I Iran, I mean, it's... It, it's, it's you know, quite apparent that Israel may well have taken uh, military action against Iran's nuclear program were it not for the restraining influence of the United States. So I think uh, John's right that in, in, in some cases small countries can feel emboldened um, and that's really a question for the United States to ensure that, uh, that, they, that they don't act recklessly. But I think in, in some of these major areas of, of tension in the world, uh, the U.S.'s alliance commitments have actually been a source for stability. Um, one, and I, as it just to reiterate my earlier point, I think one of the great dangers that we're facing in the world today and going, future, uh, going forward is that many countries, many longtime U.S. allies, are beginning to question to the extent to which they can rely upon the United States. They're worrying about the U.S.'s, uh, what they perceive as isolationist tendencies in the United States. And this, I think, is a far greater danger uh, going forward than the United States being overcommitted uh, to, to small countries. Okay. John, if I can go back to you in Washington, I mean, I, Israel has been brought up and so has been Iran. I mean, it, it's Israel and Saudi Arabia that are blocking a potential breakthrough in diplomacy between Washington and Tehran. I mean, these alliances are stopping a very... I mean, you, there's a, this is a great debate about Iran, but this is an opportunity in front of us. Should alliances be that barrier? Shouldn't it be resolving regional issues? 
Look, that's that's exactly right. Uh, the United States well, is so um, beholden no. to its supposed allies in Saudi Arabia and Israel uh, that you know we have this possibility to have an actual uh, detente with Iran. And it's clearly within our interests, because the other alternative is that isolation and tensions continue down the line, and we have supposed allies like Israel advocating war, just as they did in Iraq. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that was a real possibility if we didn't have some willingness on the part of the leadership in Washington and Tehran to uh, get together and, and talk. That's clearly within our interests, and our supposed allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel, don't want it to happen, and they've been loudly objecting, uh, f which, is, which is sort of silly. They're supposed to be our weaker allies, our client states, according to Washington, but for their own reasons, they oppose Iran. Um, and, and it's contrary to our interests. This is another example, entangling alliances. If we fall out of our own interests, uh, we'd okay. have a much more if peaceful Middle East, and I think that the, the United States would be less and less um, interventionist in its policy, because oftentimes we intervene on behalf of the uh, wishes and wills of our allies, and that's, that's in nobody's interest. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on dangerous entanglement. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing dangerous liaisons. Okay, Dov, I'd like to go back to you in New York. Early in the program, you gave us one side of the coin. John gave us the other side of the coin when it comes to entanglements. You want to rebut what John had to say before we went to the break? Please go ahead. Yes, that's right. I, 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 I mean, I, there's a couple of points there that I, I, I have to, uh, you know, take issue with. First of all, I think uh, in the example that uh, John was mentioning about the uh, uh, Israel and Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, in actual fact, the fact is that despite Saudi Arabia and Israel's obvious opposition to uh, the recently signed Geneva Accord, um, the, ten the interim uh, agreement over Iran's nuclear uh, uh, program, the United States went ahead and signed that accord, even though it was very apparent that Saudi Arabia and Israel were not happy about that. So I think the fact that the United States has conducted, uh, under the Obama administration, diplomacy with Iran, in fact, has done so secretly for the last, uh, uh, for over a year, and has now signed an interim nuclear agreement and, and, is, uh, and is intent or hopeful to sign a comprehensive agreement despite the concerns of Saudi Arabia and Israel, I think end indicates that, in fact, the United States has pursued its own interests in, in the Middle East and continues to do so. I would point to uh, another example where the United States has pursued its own interests in the region with regard to Egypt. Uh, the United States, um, you know, albeit somewhat reluctantly, but did ultimately support the overthrow of uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, despite the fact that, again, Israel and Saudi Arabia were opposed to that. So I don't think it, so I think it's wrong to imagine that somehow U.S. foreign policy in, in the Middle East, at least, is entirely beholden to Israel and Saudi Arabia. Certainly, those are countries whose uh, interests and concerns the United States takes into account, but not to the extent to which it, it limits America's freedom of action, as we see in both of those instances. Okay. And I, I think with regards to uh, Can I just Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, themselves, that. I know we it's want quite to get understandable Nick in here, that but... they have... Okay, hang on. i got to get Nick in here, okay, because there are three guests here. Uh, Nick, would you like to weigh in on that? Because it's uh, uh, what uh, Dov had to say about uh, Iran and in Egypt, there's a, there's a, that's part of the record. Let's, keep, uh, let's uh, make that clear. But at the same time, there are forces in, on Capitol Hill that are heavily influenced by a certain lobby and other lobbies that want to obstruct any kind of of a, a diplomatic uh, outreach to uh, Iran. It's, I would say it's still very early days when it comes to the American detente with um, Tehran. Go ahead, weigh in, Nick. Right. How, how much weight can you really put behind the interim agreement with Iran? 
I don't put uh, a whole lot of faith behind that. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm a cynic, but I am going to wait and see on on the Iran situation. It has uh, admittedly been going better than many of us uh, had expected, and and we are hoping for the the most peace possible. So if uh, if that goes forward, then that'll be great. But that's not uh, you know that that's not cause to forget about uh, the U.S. Constitution. I have to bring it up again because when we when we talk about when we talk about uh, you know the idea of whether or not alliances are inherently dangerous, uh, you know uh, how are we going? We we have the real world today that we're that we're faced with, and we're not going to break up these alliances. We're not going to change U.S. foreign policy by having a, a well-mannered uh, discussion about it. The only way that it's going to change is people in their own states, people in their own local communities, changing it. And uh, I, I would just say that people have to take a look at the war powers in the Constitution and, and take a look around you, take a look around you at the warfare across the planet and understand that the U.S. Constitution has nothing to do with that. And if we want to fundamentally change, if we do believe that these alliances are dangerous and the warfare and the killing that they lead to are dangerous, then we have to go to basics and go to square one. So I would advise Americans to take a look at the Defend the Guard Act and uh, understand that 28 percent of the deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan were of their own state's National Guard troops. If people took uh, control of their foreign policy in creative ways on the local and state level, then Washington, D.C., uh, you know, with the aid of maybe another Edward Snowden-type episode or, or more uh, leaks or liberations of documents, then that's when you'll start to see Washington, D.C. change its foreign policy, but not just based on, uh, you know, a debate on pros and cons well, of the ideas of alliances. In real politic, people have to get involved and take back uh, the, their foreign policy, and, and Americans, Americans shouldn't have to pay for all of these alliances and, um, you know, foreign entanglements uh, in, in how much they have paid in, in debt and in blood, that it's not worth it, and the American people have been shut out from this. Uh, the only way that they can take it back is through the state and local level first. Okay. John, I mean, it's interesting what Nick had to say there, because the American people did speak up when it came to Syria, when uh, Obama was uh, threatening to attack the country. Um, there was this uproar, you know. And, but it, it seems to me people got better educated, because my sense in, in media, Americans are not very well educated when it comes to Iran, when it comes to Israel, when it comes to Saudi Arabia. No, Americans don't know much at all about foreign policy, and that's been true for a long time. Uh, it's been called oftentimes isolationism, and that goes back to, you know, centuries past. Um, but it's really, it's really sort of a, a more concern with, uh, the, you know, jobs and, and domestic issues. Uh, the knowledge of foreign affairs is, is scant. Um, you know, and, and Dov mentioned at the beginning this shift towards isolationism. I really don't see that. I mean, yes, after a terrible, horrible, illegal, murderous, and costly war like Iraq or before it, Vietnam, you know, the country tends to say, okay, let's step back from that. Let's step back from those excesses and focus on the home front. That's, that's natural, and it you know, sort of ebbs and flows. But it's, I, it's, hard, it's hard really to say that the United States has shifted in an isolationist direction. We still have, you know, a thousand military well, bases, if I could just in, jump. Uh, you know, uh, all around the world. Uh, and before before you jump in, I just want to rebut something that you said. I know we don't want to go back uh, in the conversation, but you know you talked about Iran and the fact that we we went ahead with these uh, discussions and negotiations despite the objections of Israel and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that was after almost 40 years of isolation. We had many many uh, countless opportunities to come to an agreement before that, and we didn't, primarily because we were beholden to certain interests that were not our own. Uh, you know, and, and it's caused all kinds of horrible things. I mean, right now, the Iranians are suffering under the, one of the harshest sanctions regimes in the world. That, that's economic warfare of a very severe kind, where people are not being able to get food on the table, and uh, their, their uh, currency is, is skyrocketing. Uh, they can't import the right kind of medicines. I mean, it's, it's terrible what's happening. And this 
kind of suffering, just one example of it, never needed to happen because we could have had a detente decades ago. But it was, it didn't happen because because of the U.S. Uh, relationship and and uh, beholdenness to to Saudi Arabia and Israel. Okay, Don from New York, go ahead, jump in. Well, I think that's uh, uh, first of all. I think your character, uh, the characterization of U.S. Iranian relations, is a little uh, simplistic. There have been periods of detente, actually. I mean, if we just think back to the uh, opening of the uh, war in Afghanistan, where there was uh, tacit cooperation between the United States uh, and Iran uh, in the overthrow of the Taliban. There have been uh, other periods of cooperation. It's a bit. Um, I think that the relationship has ebbed and flowed. It has been largely one um, marked by tension, and I think. That's largely because, um, in part, because of the kind of traumatic legacy um, of uh, U.S. Iranian his, uh, uh, history, particularly the, the 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 hostage crisis from the United States and and uh, the U.S.'s role in in the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh. Um, but I think it's basically because of American foreign policy and American interests. America ha had decided once the Islamic Republic was established that um, it wanted to contain Iran and it's pursued that policy not uh, because uh, simply simply because, as John suggests, it's been uh, in the interests of Saudi Arabia and Israel, but because it's how America, the, how the United States, has defined its own interests. Now, that may be wrong. That may be, uh, John may think that that is, uh, uh, th that's been the wrong policy, and I, and I think in some cases he has a point. But I think we shouldn't blame whatever flaws or errors uh, we see in American foreign policy on its allies. That is really, um, I think, uh, an excuse uh, to let Washington off the hook. I, I well, want to just is, go back is, to, uh, as well we, to the point we, we agree about here. isolationism we, and correct. Okay, John. If I may. No, but maybe, John, if I, if um, I get. I, I gentlemen, we're to, almost just, out of time here. But, you know, uh, John, well, some would claim that uh, the U.S. has the wrong allies. We look in the Middle East. I mean, um, before the state of Israel, uh, the U.S. didn't have any enemies in the Middle East. Uh, and now it has many, in, um, countless number of enemies in the Middle East now. And that's not, the, that's not to cast aspersions on the state of Israel. But, I mean, if you put so, all of your eggs in one basket, you, it's bound to be a blowback to you. And this is what we've seen over decades. Well, the relationship with Israel is problematic in a lot of reasons, not just to, to, to do with regional issues, but also, you know, we pay them $3 billion every year and we give them all of our, uh, you know, highest tech weapons technology and so forth. And yet they basically spit in our face when we try to, uh, re, you know, uh, broker negotiations between Israel and Palestine. And they do things that are clearly outside the wishes of the United States, like continuing to build s settlements. Um, you know, and the U.S. continues to support them, even even with this sort of defiance. But I want to go back to something Dov said, and I, we do agree that part of this, w w this is a small issue that we're talking about in terms of entangling alliances and the, and the terrible things that can occur because of them. A lot of this is domestic U.S. foreign policy and, you know, the, the, the perception of people, policymakers in Washington, uh, what they think is, is the right kind of foreign policy. Uh, the global domination of the world which has essentially been the U.S. policy since World War II, uh, and especially the Middle East, uh, where the United States wants to maintain absolute he hegemony and make all the other powers as weak as possible, unless, they're, uh, unless they're, they obey our demands, like Israel is sometimes. Uh, you know, th this is, this is a one small aspect of an overall grand strategy, an overall foreign policy towards the world that, that is problematic. And yes, there are also problems with the United States' perception of, of foreign policy. So on that, we agree. Okay, on that note, on a note of agreement, thank you very much, gentlemen. Many thanks to my guests in Washington, New York, and in Los Angeles. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules. I love you.